Welcome to this lecture on section 9.2 in our text. We will be examining limits again, but this time at values of infinity. First we examine the idea of continuity. A function is continuous if it has a smooth graph. That is, there are no holes, which is a gap in the graph, or jumps in the graph. For a continuous graph, um, excuse me, for a continuous function, you could draw the entire graph without lifting your pencil from the graph paper. Here are examples of a continuous graph, a discontinuous graph because of a hole, and another discontinuous function because of a jump. We can use the idea of limits to prove continuity, that a function is continuous. To be continuous at a point C, a function must meet three criteria, all three. First, the point must exist, that is, there is a value for f of C if it doesn't exist, and this is usually an example of a hole. Number two, the limit as x approaches C must exist. Here, if this doesn't exist, this is usually because there is a jump where the one-sided limits exist but are not the same. 3. The limit as x approaches c must have the same value as the y value, or f of c. If any of these conditions are not met, then the function is discontinuous. You need to know these criteria. You need to know all three. Another way to think of continuity is to look at the domain of a function, or specifically the values of x that are outside the domain or are not allowed. Remember if we have a fraction or a rational expression, zeros are not allowed in the denominator. For square roots, the number inside the radical house cannot be negative. So in this expression that we see on the screen, we set the denominator equal to zero to find all the values of x where the function f of x does not exist. This would be rule one. Notice when we do this, and then we solve algebraically for this, we get x equals three halves. Notice when x equals three halves, the function value f of x does not exist or the function is discontinuous at x equals 3 halves. So the function is continuous at all values of x except 3 halves. Now let's look at how we write this. There are two types of notations for writing intervals or ranges along the x-axis. The first is called interval notation which you can think of as speaking a number line, defining the number line from point to point by indicating all the endpoints from left to right. We use square brackets to indicate included values. In equations, these use the inequality symbols with the line under, meaning greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to. We use parentheses to indicate excluded values. In equations, these would use the inequality symbols greater than or less than. The other form is set notation, which uses a squiggly bracket. It then identifies the variable we are defining, and then a straight vertical line. The straight vertical line, which means defines or such as, and then it's followed by an equation or a description. So when we look at the answer to the last problem, which was that the function was discontinuous for all values of x except for x equals 3 halves, for interval notation, we think along the number line. Remembering the end arrows represent negative and positive infinity, and then indicate all the values shaded. So we get parentheses, negative infinity, comma, 3 halves, parenthesis. 
Notice this documents the left side of the line. We have a hole at 3 halves, so we jump over and document the right side. Parentheses, 3 halves, comma, infinity, parentheses. Since we are documenting the entire line, we put a U in the middle, indicating union. For set notation, we simply write the ruler equation, bracket, x, straight line, again, which means defined as, x does not equal 3 halves, bracket. So let's try another example. Sometimes with fractions or rational expression, factoring helps. You might want to pause here and see if you can solve this. Remember, set the denominator equal to 0. Here we can actually simplify the original function. But when we are considering continuity, we must look at the original equation, not the simplified version. So we need to set each of the factors equal to 0 and solve the factors in the original problem. So x plus 2 and x minus 2 from the original function. And we get that the function is not continuous when x equals 2 or x equals negative 2. Now we write these in interval and set notation as we can as can be seen here at the bottom of the screen. Some function rules can help us determine continuity. Rational functions, as we have seen, are continuous at all values except values that make the de denominator equal zero. Polynomials are continuous for all values. And piecewise functions need to be checked at the break in the intervals. Let's look at an example for that one. Here we can see that the break is at negative 1. As we have one formula, when the formula when x is less than or equal to negative 1, and we have another formula or a value when x is greater than negative 1. In order to evaluate continuity, we plug negative 1, which is the break value, into each equation and solve. Notice that we are, what we are doing is we're finding the one-sided limits, as we did in the prior lecture. In the first equation, we get the left-sided limit approaching from the negative, and this equals 2. In the second equation, we get the right-sided limit approaching from the positive value, values greater than negative 1, and this equals 3. Remember, if one-sided limits are not the same, we don't have a full limit. So the function is not continuous by rule number 2, specifically at x equals negative 1. We now write these we write the continuity in interval in both forms of notation, set and interval. We're now going to evaluate limits at infinity. This is when x approaches positive or negative infinity. Remember on a graph, these are indicated by the arrows at each end of the axis. We say there is a limit or that it exists if the value of y or f of x approaches a constant value as x approaches infinity. Some basic rules help us evaluate equations. The first rule says if there are only numbers in the numerator and x raised to any power, including 1, in the denominator, then this value will equal 0. This makes sense. You might think of it like your chance at winning the lottery. You have a very small number in the numerator and a very large number in the denominator, meaning your chances are one in a million, etc. 
The second rule says if you have just x or x raised to a power, then we say that the limit does not exist because the function keeps growing to positive infinity or shrinking to negative infinity, which really means that it's not going, it's not limited in its value. It just keeps growing or shrinking. To find these limits analytically, at least for rational equations, we divide each term in the numerator and each term in the denominator by the largest power of x. Let's try a couple of examples. Let's do the first problem together and then you can pause and do the second problem on your own. In the first problem we can see that the largest power is 1. That is the largest exponent on any x in the equation. Dividing each term by x to the power of 1 is the same as multiply, multiplying the numerator and denominator by 1 over x. When we do this and simplify, we get 2 minus 1 over x in the numerator and 1 plus 2 over x in the denominator. Notice that both the second terms, 1 over x and 2 over x, become 0 from the first basic rule. So we are left with the answer of 2 over 1, or simply 2. This is the answer for this limit. If you graph this equation on your calculator, you will see the graph starts centering on y equals 2 as x gets larger. You could also look at the table function on your calculator for this function for larger values of x. So let's try the second example. Hit pause now and try this one on your own. We want to find the largest power of x in the entire equation. In this case we have a power of 2. So we divide each term by x squared, the same as multiplying numerator and denominator by 1 over x squared. This gives us 1 plus 3 over x squared in the numerator and 1 over x squared minus 1 over x in the denominator. Again, three of these terms, and when we look at, we can see the denominator now is going to become closer and closer to 0 as x moves to infinity by basic rule number 1. So the limit doesn't exist because we have 1 over 0. Again, this is growing to infinity, which means the limit does not exist. The last thing we're going to look at today is asymptotes. A horizontal asymptote is a line y equals a constant or f of x equals a constant. And this will be the same value as the limit at infinity for the function. If the limit as x approaches positive or negative of infinity of f of x, if this equals b, then the line y equals b is the horizontal asymptote of f of x. Notice as x goes to a positive direction, goes towards positive infinity or negative infinity, f of x or, or y on the graph the, goes to the line y equals 2. Let's look at that. So in this graph we say there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 which you can see illustrated by the bright yellow line. <clears throat> can you see a vertical asymptote? This is where the y values approach positive infinity or negative infinity at a specific value of x. In this case, we can see that at x equals 3, the graph curves up and down to both infinities. So we say the vertical asymptote is the line x equals 3. See you next lecture. Make sure you try your homework.